Before we begin, Karen, would you please give an invocation? Thank you. Janan Nicoltani, thank you for um, your guidance and your direction. Help us to do what is right for the land and the animals. Help us to do right by our people. Help us to be good stewards of the land, good stewards over our waters, good stewards over our, our relatives, the fish and the wildlife. Help us to be um, mindful always of your bidding and your work. You put us on this land to be the stewards and we thank you for that. We thank you for your provisions and we thank you that you brought all these people here. We th ask that you keep them safe as they travel home and guide and direct their work to do what is best for the resources as well. We just thank you. Chinan Nicoltani. Thank you, Karen. And uh, next, I'd like to ask Jody Polisi to say a few words about our colleague, Deborah Simmons. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Jody Pelosi. I'm going to speak uh, really briefly about a, a colleague, Deborah, Dr. Deborah Simmons. Deb was born in 1962 in Arizona and then uh, moved up with her family into the Northwest Territories. They lived in Fort Smith and Yellowknife. She spent time with her family in the Mackenzie Mountains while her father did his field work with the assistance of local people from the community of Tulita. Deb loved spending time with her family, the local peoples, and she loved being an auntie to her nieces and nephews. In the 1980s, she was a master's student at Trent University and a PhD student at York University. Her PhD thesis was on the political economy of indigenous oppression in Canada, and it remains a landmark piece of historical materialistic uh, research. She was an adjunct professor and an advisor at the University of Manitoba. Deb returned to the North in the late 1990s, working with the Satu Land Use Planning Board, the Delaney Uranium Team, the Delaney Knowledge Center, and lastly with the Satu Renewable Resources Board. She started with the Satu Renewable Resources Board in 2012 as the Executive Director, following in her dad's footsteps doing groundbreaking work to help realize their shared goal of genuine Indigenous sovereignty over wildlife and resources in the Northwest Territories. She was a leader in Indigenous-led conservation planning. She assisted with the development of the Delaney Caribou Plan for the Blue Nose East Barren Ground Caribou Herd, and the Neo Nepene Begare Shuta Epe Nahara Trails of the Mountain Caribou Mountain Plan Management Plan. She had a love of the Mackenzie Mountains and worked tirelessly to bring the Shuta Utne people together to support the caribou plan people constructed for the mountain caribou on both sides of the Yukon and the NWT border. She was a passionate and constant advocate for the resurgence and revitalization of Denekade language and Denesile ways of life and their connection to community well-being as well as an understanding that many concepts and much meaning can only come through Dene language. Deb was deeply committed to indigenous governance and self-determination recognizing that indigenous knowledges and practices are regenerated on and in relation to the land, and that barriers exist to indigenous people spending time on the land, including financial barriers. As such, Debbie created the Dene Sile Dene Way of Life Fund. This fund will support Satu Dene and Métis youth to spend time living with and learning from elders and knowledge holders out on the land. Sadly, Deb lost her battle with cancer in October 2022. Deb could inspire and frustrate at precisely the same moment, but she always managed to get one to stop, to think, and by working together, come up with ways to improve co-management. I miss my friend. I wish she was here. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. My name is Hannah Voorhees with the Federal Subsistence Management Program here in Alaska. And together with colleagues Matt Cameron with the National Park Service, Todd Brinkman with the U University of Alaska Fairbanks, our moderator Henry Huntington and the panelists here today, uh, we work to bring this plenary session together for you. 
From early in the conference planning process, the organizing committee knew that we wanted to highlight Indigenous co-management of caribou. However, we realized that the term management itself can sometimes be problematic and at times uh, it might be better replaced with concepts such as stewardship and reciprocity. And we also realized that arrangements for making stewardship of caribou more inclusive have evolved very differently across Alaska and Canada depending on local context. So one of our goals was therefore to represent a range of voices from across the co-management spectrum. We hope the discussion today will showcase instances in which co-stewardship is working well, resulting in conservation success. At the same time, we hope to learn from one, one another so that we can work towards greater inclusion of indigenous knowledge and decision making where there is still room for growth. We are grateful to all our panelists and also to the National Science Foundation Arctic Social Sciences Program for supporting travel for our panelists. And uh, next, I'll turn the panel over to our esteemed moderator, Henry Huntington. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Hannah, and good morning. Um, yeah. Maybe you do have to push it. You have to look. If there's a red light, you need to push the one on the bottom. I guess there have been microphone problems from time to time. Good morning. Um, I'm Henry Huntington. It's my honor to moderate the panel this morning. We have seated with me on the, on the platform up here a tremendous breadth and depth of experience with with caribou and with the land and, and with stewardship across North America. Um, and our aim this morning is to have a conversation among people who have been deeply and intimately involved with these topics for a long time. Uh, we're going to start with just uh, going down the, the, uh, the, the group here with a brief introduction of where they're from and the, the context of, of caribou and stewardship in their area. Um, and with a specific question of um, what's working well and what needs work in, in that area. And so I've asked all the panelists to, to start with that. We'll go, we'll go down, the, uh, down the row here. And after that, um, as I said, we'll, we'll see where the conversation takes us. We were discussing this yesterday and the term organic came up. So we're, we're not super structured. We'd just like to see where the where the conversation flows, and it was flowing in a pretty interesting way last night, so I hope we didn't use up all our good ideas. Um, you have met um, the, the, all but one of the panelists are described in your book, so I won't give, uh, you know, read their bios, you can do that. Vern Cleveland, Karen Linnell, Joe Tetlici, Dina Lemke, the one who's not, Tina Giroux Raylard, who is um, executive director of the Beverly and Kamenuriak Caribou Management Board. Uh, thank you very much for being willing to fill in at the last minute. We had a few people who, uh, for various reasons, couldn't make it, but we're delighted that, that Tina can join us. And then, as you've already met, Jody Pellissey as well. Um, so at this point, Vern, please start us off. Hello. Oh, good morning. Welcome to my homeland, great state of Alaska. <coughs> I've been hunting caribou since, uh, with dog team, 1966, I was 10 years old. And I watched the changes over the years. From climate change, caribou, everything. I lived through it. And I'm still living with it today. There's hardships, there's good things, like I would say, the good, the bad, the ugly. And it's happening. The decline of our, with our tutu. And you pay that long, okay, 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 
But I, I grew up with caribou. I live off the caribou. And I'm still am today. I learned from my forefathers, my uncles, my brothers, aunts, that what you call those women with rifles that molly me or whatever they call them. They were some women with, that are best and great hunters. We live a life where it's hard. Right now I live in the high, highest cost of living in my area, in the state of Alaska. Twelve, eleven dollars a gallon gas, heating fuel. With no sign of going down. There's, no, there's nothing. It's hardship. That's why we work together in the villages. When someone's in need, we come together and help each other out. We just don't leave them out, go starving. We help them out, either, either in our village or the next village. We help each other out. This road you guys talking about, this Amlam Road, that mineral that go, go up to our area. I talked to some elders. Well, I'm an elder, but uh, they're a little older than I am. But uh, some of them said, uh, we want that road. They're tired of being broke. Tired of just spending their money on fuel. It's gonna change. Maybe for the better. I mean, you look at U.S. The government wants a road. They're going to build a road. They won't care what you say. They're going to run right over you. Most of you guys watch cowboy and Indian movies. Who loses? The Indian. And the cowboy wins. That's what's going to happen here. And, and it will happen, and I'm for the road. Probably will make the cost of living lower. It's very hard. Some lot, lot will disagree with me, but they don't live where I live. They're not from my area that are saying, hey, we don't want the road. But someday, the caribou down, like right now, and the Western Arctic Caribou Hurt Working Group made a proposal that, that uh, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, that we should get four per year, four caribou already get some feedback that they said they can't live on four caribou per year. And they're blaming it on me because I'm the chairman of the Western Arctic Caribou Working Group. I didn't make this decision. The group from all the state of Alaska made that decision. And they just, as a chairman, I just put it on the vote. Whoever gets the highest vote, yes and no. And that's how it works. But you know, uh, seeing people from all over the country and meeting people from all over the country here, I mean, I got stunned. You know, I, I, Canadians, Bangladesh, Mexicans. Can you believe caribou in Mexico? <laughs> That's what he told me. He went caribou in Mexico, and I, and I was like, "Am I okay?" <laughs> we can try it, but uh, you know, you never know. The world might change because 
This climate change is changing. I watched it over the years. I watched the permafrost, the hills are melting down because of climate change. The river is changing, eroding lots, big time. The fish, the animals, the tutu, tutu is caribou. They're on a very decline right now, low. What my message is, I'm trying to get my people to understand that if we're out of caribou, we're going to be hungry, hunting moose, bear. <coughs> but why is it declining? It's a question. They got, they got the same thing. They're declining too. Is it in a cycle? Like in 1972 or 70, like Jim, the brains of Northwest Arctic Borough Caribou Herd Working Group man, you ask Jim Dow, he'll ask you, answer you any question you ask him. He knows. And I know, I know. Because he's been there a long time. I ain't, go, I ain't going to follow his footsteps. Because I'm in your back. I could speak both languages. Buenos si, dias, senor. <laughs> I didn't, they didn't want me to speak my language in school. I lost, I almost lost my language, but I kept, kept going, kept. And teach elders that were older that didn't know how to speak English. I grew up in that era. To make, uh, I could stand here all morning and talk. But we got a panel here that needs to hear. But I, I welcome each and every one of you to our great state of Alaska. And thank you for Kyle for putting me up here. <laughs> thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Karen Linnell. I'm the executive director for the Atna Intertribal Resource Commission. The Atna Co Intertribal Resource Commission, or ATRIC, is comprised of eight federally and state recognized tribes, um, two ANCSA corporations, because they're the landowners in, in our area. Our territory is roughly the size of Ohio. We have an MOA with the Department of Interior to cooperatively manage wildlife on federal lands. We're not allowed to manage wildlife on our own lands, but we can help the feds manage theirs. And that's something in itself. We've been trying for years to get it to where we can manage wildlife on our own lands, like much like they do in the lower 48 um, with the tribes there. And so we're, we're up, we operate under um, tribal authority, and they've, they've given us resolutions to, to work on fish and wildlife issues for, on their behalf. Um, we've got partnerships that have grown from the ground up. Um, we just finished a recent project regarding bears. Um, we had an elder who was getting at, at a regional meeting, he was getting upset. He says, why are we allowing people to come on our land to hunt bears? You don't even know what's going on out there. And so that got us thinking, what is going on out there? He said, I bet nobody knows what's going on. So we went to the state and they had a, eh, we, we think there's like this many bears out there. And um, through that, we set up a, 26 square mile plots and had one hair snare in there. And at that time of year, they said, you'll be lucky to see one. At, so we did the season, sent the hair off for um, samples or DNA analysis. 
and started our second season before we got the analysis back. At the end of the season, we got the analysis back, 30, 30 bears. So the third year, the state of Alaska did some plots. And we expanded to four plots. And so we were running in tandem. And um, we'd asked them, do you want to partner on this? We can provide non-federal match for the Pittman-Roberts money. And it was like, yeah, no, we're, we're good, we're good. And uh, at the end of the year, at the end of the season, they said, we did use you as match. And, and our biologists, um, Intertribal Resource Commission's biologists, worked with the state biologist and UAF to come up with a methodology to, for their, the fourth season, which was the first full year. We did all of game management, at, game management unit 13, and, um, and worked on a project where they used the same methodology and collected samples, and I think we got over 900 that year between all of the different uh, places. And then the last year, last, last season, was our final year on it, and it was done head to head with what, how they normally do the bears, with the flying every day for two weeks, and looking at collared bears, and then counting how many bears they see. And so we just got the DNA analysis back. Um, they're analyzing it, and then they're gonna extrapolate it out. So. We're going to compare that to what the aerial flights did. That collaboration um, is something that works. And now we're looking at a caribou herd, the Nelchina caribou herd, who, who's gone from 38,000, 40,000 down to 17,433, I think is the number. So less than half of the management objective. And there's room for collaboration in writing a caribou management plan to help bring them back. Our people are really concerned about it. One of the things that I notice in management is that they try to flatline, naturally fluctuating um, populations and, and keep it in that small range. Uh, it's too small of a range and then um, we're also working with uh, ADFNG and and University of Anchorage here on um, on caribou habitat assessment and looking at what can the land sustain. Um, we hear that a lot. It's more than the land can sustain, but there's nothing been studied or written in decades, decades, and there's been a lot of change out there. We've got a lot more traffic. People are going farther with the four-wheelers and things like that. It used to be horses and dog teams, and now it's it, and now it's four-wheelers, swamp buggies, the new Sherp snow machines. You know, things that tear up the terrain and the land. And so it's had a great impact on the carrying capacity, and that's something that we want to look at and quantify. We've seen changes and are looking at how can we fix it? How can we provide additional information so that the managers can better manage? Filling information gaps is where you can work with tribes and tribal organizations to um, partner with them on that and bring things forward. It's traditional knowledge and that aspect and how we've seen things change and uh, and it's it's funny that we have to back it up with science and and in that stuff our elders have been talking about how the fish are getting smaller for years and so the state of Alaska has been collecting samples um, of salmon and taking the the length and measurement uh, the length measurements and the sex and all this and uh, old list samples looking at how old they are and they finally went back and looked at all that data they've been collecting for for decades and found out yeah the salmon are like three inches shorter you know leading to fecundity issues the quantified what the elder had been telling them so um, I seen this up 
at uh, another place where uh, I was at the uh, National Fish and Wildlife Society meeting in Fairbanks a few years back, and um, there's a gentleman from North Slope Borough. He said, the elder's been telling us <clears throat> for years that we weren't counting the, the whales under the ice. And uh, when he said that, he's like, yeah, oh, no, they can't stay under there that long. Well, technology finally caught up. They put GPS trackers on them and found out that they have a much larger range and go farther and longer than, you know. So using and incorporating traditional knowledge is so important. Um, he also said the whales can smell you, and they didn't believe him. And after years of telling him, they were able, he got permission to bisect a whale's head, and they found olfactory glands. So listening to your elders, filling information gaps, and working with tribes can better inform your projects and, and better inform management. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Joseph Terlici. I'm the chair of the Porcupine Caribou Management Board. Uh, I got five minutes to put pull everything together, and I'm going to just ramble. So uh, just just bear with me. Um, in 1995, I got a, appointed as the Porcupine Caribou Management Chair. Uh, 30 years later, I'm still here um, because it's a passion of mine. When we first, when I first got appointed in 1995, um, through traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge, um, we didn't have a very good count. And uh, just a really brief outlook of the pork bank caribou management. It is uh, the pork bank caribou management was established under the Inevaluate Final Agreement in the Delta region of the NWT in 1985. Uh, once it was settled, there was five claimant groups that were part of it, and also three governments, the two territorial governments, Yukon and NWT, and the Government of Canada. Our prime mandate is for the protection of the habitat range, the health of the herd, and the continuance, meaning that we always want that herd there for future generations. When I first got uh, appointed on the management board, uh, we didn't have a clear understanding of where the caribou were. Thank goodness for the government of Canada and the two territories, they were doing scientific information with the caribou, and we knew that back in 1987, when the first count was done, actually I should back up a little further, in the early 70s with Don Russell, um, working as a Canadian biologist, a Yukon biologist, they did a count and manually actually counted the caribou with um, uh, indigenous people actually being on the f in the field and counting, literally counting the caribou. In the early 70s, we know that the porcupine caribou was under 100,000, in and around 100,000. In 1987, we got a count and the porcupine caribou was 178,000. 10 years later, 2001, when we finally did another count, the porcupine caribou was 123,000. 10 years later, 2010, the porcupine caribou was 100 and I believe 69,000. Two years later, 2012, it was 197,000. Two years later, 2015, it was 218,000. The last count we got in 2017, I believe, was 218,000 plus. So we have an understanding of where the caribou is going. The trend was going up, coming back down, and more or less going back up. So our caribou, is, um, I shouldn't say our caribou because this is an international herd. The caribou is sort of like doing well. When I said the porcupine caribou was, the porcupine caribou board was established under the Inevaluate Final Agreement, we realized two years later that, um, we realized during that time that the porcupine caribou was an international herd. 
So if we're going to manage the porcupine caribou on the Canadian side, we definitely had to have uh, a buy-in from um, the United States. So two years later, we got a, a, a international porcupine caribou agreement um, signed, sealed, and delivered by uh, the United States government. So we have an international uh, board. I can safely say that it's inactive right now, mainly because we don't have any appointees on the Alaskan side right at the moment, so we're inactive right now. Um, in 19, when I mentioned that in 2001, the porcupine caribou population was 123,000, we were, as a board, watching all around us. We knew that in the Tuck area, uh, north of Inuvik, the Cape Bathurst, the Blue Nose were declining um, at a rapid um, decline. We also knew that uh, in the Yellowknife area and the NWT, the Bathurst herd was also declining. We also knew that the George River herd in uh, Labrador, northern Quebec, was drastically declining. And as we were watching, we realized that because we lost 55,000 caribou between 1987 and 2001, we had to do something. We also knew that through, through um, scientific knowledge that once the, once, the pork pain, once the caribou starts declining and people start keep on hunting the way they usually do, that it's going to be harder for it to rebound. So we held that and from 2001 until 2006, we, 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 we watched the caribou around us, and we also knew that, that we had to do something. We didn't want to run into a situation like other caribou herds. So in 2006, in a clavic in the NWT, we made a motion, we made a resolution for the conservation of the porcupine caribou. From there on, we started realizing that in this day and age, we have faster skidoos, we have faster outboard motors, we have planes, we have choppers, we have climate change, and all that is affecting the porcupine caribou. We knew that we had no control over climate change or global warming, but we do have uh, control over harvesting. So we focused on the harvesting aspect of the well-being of the porcupine caribou. So what does that look like? What is a harvest management plan? We, we, we went to the communities because that's, that's one of the things that we really value is our input from the communities. And communication, I always say the communication for the PCMP is right to the T with the communities because there are eyes and ears on the land. And if we wanted to manage the herd, we definitely had to um, get the trust from the communities. And that's what we did. We spent two years in regards to uh, telling people about the harvest management plan and what it's gonna look like. And basically what it is, is that if a population is in a certain, if, 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 the, pop, if, there's, if the caribou is in a certain population range, we could, we, could, we could keep harvesting the way we want, but if it starts declining, then we have to start kicking in management zones, management actions. Um, we spent over four years, I think, in regards to <coughs> trying to develop this harvest management plan, and when we started in 2006, in 2010, we actually got that uh, harvest management plan signed, sealed, and delivered by all eight parties to the Porcupine Caribou Management Board. So, um, the, the population zones we look at is something like a fire chart. So if you go on the highway, you see a fire chart, you know if the arrow is in the, gr in the red, that means you can't have fires or anything like that. But if it's in the green, you can go out and you know have picnics, barbecues, and whatever. We, see, we use that same model and we just put population um, counts on, on each of the zones. So what we used was if it was under red, that was 45,000. If it was between the yellow and uh, orange, it was 80,000. 
and if it was above the green, it's 115,000. So um, I'm happy to say that since the uh, porcupine, the harvest management plan was established back in 2010, we've always been in the green. We've always been in the green, so people are just harvesting the way they usually do. But if we ever get to, let's say, the 80,000, then we have to kick in our management <coughs> actions. One of the things that um, we still have to do is, because this is an international herd, is that we still have to try to adopt this or take it into Alaska, into the Guchin communities and explain the process that we go through and hopefully they, we can get a buy-in. Um, having said that, uh, we still have uh, some problems in regards to harvest counts. Uh, people don't trust trust um, giving their their um, harvest counts. Um, however, uh, thank goodness we're still in the green and we're still working with the communities to get them to understand that if they give us that count, then if we ever get into a situation where we have to do a total allowable harvest, how is that going to be determined? It's going to be determined by the amount of caribou harvested in each community. So basically if somebody, like in Oak Crow, is a small community, they use a lot of caribou, if they give us information on how much they, they, they take, then um, if we ever get to an allocation, they would get a certain percentage of it. And that's the way it, it, it's, it's developed. Um, the Dempster Highway was a, a highway that was put into the habitat range of the porcupine caribou back in 19, it started in 1970. 1970 it was uh, finally opened, but uh, once again that highway was built through the Diefenbaker government. It was a road to the riches or something like that. When that happened, there was no consultation with the First Nations in regards to putting that road in on the habitat range and our elders uh, basically said, we're in for trouble. And right now we have uh, a lot of challenges um, in regards to hunting on the Dempster. Um, however, with a lot of education and, and the board going on the Dempster Highway, uh, we're, I think, doing pretty good. I uh, just want to close off with saying that back in 1995, when I got on board, um, land claims was a big issue that time, politics. A lot of people were saying, uh, you know, it's my right to, to harvest caribou and I can take whatever I want, whenever I want, whatever sex I want, I can take it. But 30 years later, people are saying, I have an Aboriginal right, but I also have a responsibility. So we've come a long way from, let's say, from 1985 to 2023, and um, it's looking good. It's looking good for us because we have a, a, a porcupine caribou herd that's relatively doing very well, but through, uh, through scientific knowledge, we know that if there's a peak, there's a crash, and we're always um, explaining that to the, to the communities so that we can always have an understanding with them in regards to when we make decisions. So with that, thank you very much. Merci. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dina Lemke. I'm the executive director with the um, Porcupine Caribou Management Board. Can you hear me? No? You could hear Joe. Your voice was just... Good morning, everybody. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. You, you wore it out, Joe. <laughs> um, my name is Dina Lemke, and I'm the executive director with the Porcupine Caribou Management Board. Um, I've been with the board for over 20 years, and of course, the whole time working with Joe. Um, and uh, I, uh, one of the things I, I loved right away about the board is that um, it's not political. And, um, and although it represents, um, there's representatives from eight parties um, to the Porcupine Caribou Management Agreement, uh, it, uh, it's a board that um, cares very much about coming to consensus on matters. And, uh, and even though 
They represent, you know, the government of Canada, the government of the Northwest Territories, the government of Yukon, and the five indigenous governments um, within the range of the herd on, on the um, Canadian side. Um, when they come to the table, they put their political hat aside or their political um, focus of, of their party, possibly. They're aware of it, but they, but they put it aside and, and Joe always talks about how they put their caribou hat on. So, so they, they, they're not constrained. you'd like to call Lisa Lindley Robot? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> What was I saying? Oh, so th so they <laughs> so they put they put um, they put their caribou hat on, and they talk about what's in the best interest of the caribou and and what's in the best interest of the communities that rely on the caribou. So like like Joe talked about, um, you know, they want them to be around forever. So how how do they do that? And and they're not constrained by their party's position. So. They, the, the party can still have their, um, their perspectives and can still provide, um, provide that direction and input to, um, uh, to wh whatever, their, whatever their political will is or whatever they're working on, but that doesn't constrain the board. So, um, so the board, the board um, looks at consensus um, and, you know, they, the odd time they've had to come to votes on things when there's very contentious issues. Um, but even working through that, they, they do it respectfully and um, knowing that everybody is equal at the table. So I think that, um, that, that, that that's something that I valued as well and also the connection to the communities um, and, and the importance of working with the communities and taking direction from the community. So whatever it is we're working on, whether it's our harvest management strategy, um, or, or other projects, um, taking that direction from the communities is important. So going to the communities and talking to them about what do you want the harvest management plan to look like? Um, what do you want these other things to look like? How can we help you in communicating um, to hunters or about different different issues that, that arise? And and so I um, I think that 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 um, that helps build trust and it helps to. Um, to advance um, a collaborative approach to the management uh, of the of the caribou herd, so well, we've worked on some some neat projects in the past, uh, and we're currently working on some some now uh, with the communities. Uh, we have uh, how many communities, Joe? Is there seven communities? So in the Northwest Territories and in, in Yukon. Um, we're working on a, a project that, um, that's pulling together traditional knowledge uh, that has been already um, um, provided over the past decades. There, there is a ton of it, so it's looking at what is there and perhaps where some gaps are and trying to um, inform some of, the, uh, some of the different pieces of, of our conservation plan that we're building. And we're also working on an exciting project in the summer range of the caribou um, herd uh, um, that with the support of the Canadian um, Mountain Network. We have, um, we have funding to, um, to look at you know, the impacts of, of climate change and change in wildlife populations uh, within the summer range, looking at vegetation, looking at uh, different wildlife, and, and um, and building indigenous knowledge into it. I say building, but, but this, this conference has really um, shown me that, that it's important how we even approach that. How we, how we, what, what do we call it? Integrating, um, uh, braiding, yeah. But, but I think that that is something that has been very important to the board is we, we've kind of, we've missed it. Um, n n we've missed being able to get the communities to provide it and to have it at our table sometimes. I shouldn't say we missed it, but, but we need more of it. And, uh, and, and I think that we're trying to do that in a better way and, uh, and, and figure out how to, um, how to bring that together in a meaningful way um, and really use it, not just as a piece that's inserted into our plans, but as something that guides the plan um, 
and the decisions around it as much as this, the science does. And, and so we're, we're, that's, that's important to the board and we're trying to focus on how to do that in a, in a good way. Um, I think one of the challenges definitely is that we're working with these, the, we're working with these communities that are really overstretched. They have so many, so many competing priorities and such a lack of um, resources that, that you know, we can't move forward as, you know, maybe as quickly as we'd like sometimes, but we want to do it in the right way. So, so we, we respect that they have other, other com uh, competing uh, work that they're doing and they want, they want to work with us, but um, they're very overloaded and, uh, and we, we definitely feel that and uh, we, we try to, to help them figure out what do they need and we have a very cooperative and uh, collaborative um, group that cares deeply about this caribou herd and I think that that speaks to the success of, um, of the work that we're doing and, and the work of the, the management board and also that Joe, Joe does you know, take this seriously. It is his life passion and, uh, and he, it's, it's, uh, it's important for him to make sure that everybody is working together. So even if you get the odd person that's appointed that doesn't you know, realize that, that, that this, this is not um, political and it's, and, and it's about working together for the caribou, um, it doesn't take them long to, um, to, to realize that that's not this board. And, uh, and Joe, um, Joe really has a, a big hand in that. So, so I think that those are some successes and challenges and uh, we're in a good place, but we still wanna move forward. And sometimes it's like two steps forward, one step back, but we're still moving forward. So we're, we're happy about that and we're happy to even you know, collaborate with other, other management boards. We value those relationships as well and, uh, and that, that there's a cross sharing of, of, um, of information and experience. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tina Drew Robillard, and I'm the executive director for the Beverly and Caminaria Caribou Management Board. Before I start, I just want to thank Karen for doing the opening invocation of prayer and for starting the panel in a good way. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Beverly and Caminaria Caribou. So these are two herds that are named um, because of where they calf. So they calf in the Canadian Arctic. And then they spend their summers in the tundra, and then they start their migration down for the winter into the taiga and the boreal uh, forest. And so because of this very large migration, they pass through um, two territories and two provinces. So there's a lot of different jurisdictions um, that manage uh, these herds. Um, these herds are experiencing a slow but steady decline. So in 2018, the Beverly Herd's population was at about 103,000, about one-third of the size it was in the mid-1990s. And the Kamenyriak's Herd's latest population estimate is a, was about 288,000, and that's about half as many caribou in 2017 as there were about 25 years ago. So very, very slow but very consistent decline. So um, the board was created in the early 1980s. Um, biologists noticed that what they thought to be a decline in these herds, and there were very few discussions at that time between indigenous communities and government biologists. So for those that don't know, um, in Canada, when we say indigenous, we, that inc includes the Inuit, First Nations, and Métis communities. So I will be using that because our board includes all of these uh, indigenous groups. So the purpose that was to bring everybody together, which um, was really important because the indigenous communities are the original stewards of the land. They have the knowledge of how to manage these populations. And then we had the Western science um, biologists that were um, studying. And so at the time, it was a novel approach to bring everybody together. I'm happy to say we just celebrated our 40th anniversary of the board. So the board includes <clears throat> up to 17 board members. So the majority of the board is made up of Indigenous uh, members. So we have four Indigenous groups. We have um, the Inuit, the Métis, the Denisutlene, and the Cree. 
and they comprise about 20 different communities across the range, um, from the Kivalik region of Nunavut, the southeast northwest territories, uh, northern Saskatchewan, and northern Manitoba. So essentially, it's like the cream of the crop. We have the, bi the biologists, for, uh, the government biologists, and then we have the traditional knowledge uh, holders or elders that make up the board. And so these indigenous communities are really important because they depend on these migratory herds, especially lately, the Beverly and the Kamenariak are, are some of the, is the primary herds of most of these communities because of the declines that have been happening to adjacent populations. And they're often considered cultural keystone species for these communities. So the main goal of the board for the past 40 years has been to bring everybody together to work towards safeguarding the herds for current and future generations. So there's only one goal is to be the voice of the caribou when we come together. Um, so, and we've recently made some significant uh, improvements on the board, primarily to, to raise the indigenous members to be, you know, real um, government to government. Um, at the table, it's not, um, you know, before it was the board uh, biologists and then the community members would just be at the table, but now they're coming in as uh, equals. So the Caribou Management Board is a co management advisory board. So our primary responsibility is to make recommendations to the public and indigenous governments, regional organizations and communities for the conservation and management of, of caribou herds. We create a caribou management plan every 10 years and uh, we work to implement the recommendations in this caribou management plan. Um, our board is because we work so well together and we have such strong relationships, that's definitely the strength of the board. And because we do, our, um, our recommendations are quite respected in, in, in the governments <clears throat> across the range. Um, so the success of the board is the longevity and as I said, the, the relationships. But so we just went through communities where we're just working on our caribou management plan, our new caribou management plan, and we've been talking um, to people and um, getting the information and priorities. And so some of the things that we are working on, we, it was really loud and clear what we were hearing from the communities. There's two main themes. One is um, shared responsibility, right? Like everybody needs to be in it. Everybody has to take responsibility and everybody has to try and you know, implement some management actions. And the other thing was trying to, to find balance. So, which is a hard thing to do and we don't know what that balance is, but for example, balance between economic development and protection of land, right? So communities aren't against economic development. Oftentimes these are remote communities that need that uh, income, but also want to protect their way of life and the land just there. Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, the land, their traditional territories. Um, or for example, if communities or governments are um, looking at harvest restrictions, then there also needs to be restrictions on permits or development proposals and things like that. So there needs to be that balance. And then also, as Joe mentioned, um, you know, the, the indigenous rights are, are paramount, right? They're part of the Canadian Constitution. Um, they're guaranteed. But also we need to balance that, and the communities talk about this all the time now, is that comes with a huge responsibility. Um, and so helping the communities, working through all those different concerns and issues is kind of where we're... <laughs> what is go... Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. What was I saying? <laughs> oh, um, so I'll just recap. So it, with indigenous rights um, come really huge responsibilities and that's what we're hearing from our indigenous communities and uh, what the board is doing is trying to, you know, support and to navigate through these really difficult challenges that are coming ahead for the, for the caribou. 
So I'll leave it at that for now. Before I... <laughs> Okay. All right. I'm going to guess this works. Komodo uh, Huzi. Good morning. My name is Jody Pellissi. I'm the executive director for the Wakaji Renewable Resources Board. Uh, we're a wildlife management authority and institution of public government. Uh, we're created through the Clicho Agreement, which was settled in 2005. Our board is responsible for wildlife, plants, forests, and protected areas in Wakaji. Um, the board uses traditional and community knowledge as well as scientific information to make balanced decisions and we do this following the Clicho philosophy of strong like two people. The board works primarily with the Clicho government and the government of the Northwest Territories um, on caribou management uh, and our herds that we focus on are the Kokati Equal the Bathurst caribou, and the Sati Equu, which is the Blue Nose East caribou. Sorry, I'm gonna keep looking down at my cheat notes instead of looking up and trying to remember what I'm supposed to say. Um, uh, yeah, so our board is, uh, is a true co-management board, is, and it's made up of Clicho uh, citizens. We have folks from each of the four Clicho communities sitting on our board, as well as members from uh, Government of Canada and the Government of the GNWT. Our board also works with other uh, co-management boards, um, Indigenous organizations and governments in the NWT and Nunavut. That's not really why I'm here today to tell you about the WRB. I'm actually here today to tell you about uh, the Advisory Committee for the Cooperation on Wildlife Management and the Bathurst Caribou Advisory Committee. I'll apologize now. Two worst acronyms ever, ACCWM and BCAC. So just, you know, take it as you will. Uh, I'll speak first about the Advisory Committee on the Cooperation of Wildlife Management, or ACCWM. This is a one-of-a-kind group that's made up of wildlife co-management boards uh, that have authorities in the NWT and Nunavut. Um, so this group has no government members. It is only member boards that sit and make decisions about the Cape Bathurst, Blue Nose West, and Blue Nose East herds. Um, the member boards are the Wildlife Management Advisory Council of the NWT, the New Vialuit. We have the Taktu Noge National Park Management Board. We have the Gwich'in Renewable Resources Board, the Sawtu Renewable Resources Board, the Katikmiat Regional Wildlife Board from Nunavut, and my board, the WRRB. Um, each of these boards um, is responsible for um, collecting community information on each of those three herds that I mentioned earlier. As well, we um, receive scientific monitoring information from the governments um, to make annual decisions on the herd statuses for those three caribou herds. Um, for the ACCWM, um, prior to these annual herd um, status decisions uh, management plan, the Taking Care of Caribou Management Plan was um, created. Um, there was, uh, this was a, a bottom-up approach. 17 communities um, created that management plan um, over a number of years, and it was put into place in 2014. Um, that uh, management plan sets out management actions for five categories, uh, education, habitat, land use activities, predators and harvest, and it is um, each of those uh, management uh, classes, categories that has actions that are defined by the herd status that is identified by uh, the ACCWM annually. Um, each year, um, those statuses are determined and then they're submitted to government so they can implement uh, those app management actions on behalf of those co-management bodies. Uh, and, that, and so though that includes uh, the GNWT, the government of Nunavut, the Clicho government, and another uh, co-management board, the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board. Um, the ACCWM has um, been um, improving and adaptively managing its process over the last seven years, and uh, we'll be conducting our eighth annual status meeting this November. Uh, the ACCWM um, it, it operates on consensus. Um, 
I recognize and I'm very grateful for uh, the relationship building that we have created over the uh, 20 years that we have been working together and most recently on this uh, these uh, annual status decisions. Um, it's important to know that um, uh, the traditional knowledge, the community knowledge takes equal um, precedent to the science information um, and the decisions are not easily made. Um, uh, some years it's very obvious what the herd status should be, some years it is not, and sometimes it takes a long time for us to come to a consensus. Um, but the passion of the people about their caribou herds and their communities um, keeps everybody at the table and working together so we can come to a decision that um, is uh, acceptable by all. Um, I'll just quickly then also uh, mention, so in recent years, the Bathurst Caribou Advisory Committee, or the BCAC, has also developed a management plan specific for the Bathurst herd. Um, you may have heard in some um, um, discussions over the last couple of days, this herd has had a 99% decline. Um, and so um, implementing management actions is really important. Um, this uh, December, we'll have our third annual um, status meeting, and this uh, body has followed a similar model to the ACCWM, um, and you're working with, um, in this case, multiple jurisdictions. We have the NWT, Nunavut, and Saskatchewan. We have organizations, uh, Indigenous organizations and governments, as well as co-management bodies, a part of that group, that uh, come up with a status for the Bathurst herd. Um, again, um, it's uh, the passion of the people and the importance of the caribou to the communities um, and the people who sit around the table that um, we all sit there. So that's our success, is the passion and the, the, the ability to work together. Um, uh, limitation is the passion and the <laughs> of the communities. It takes time, it takes effort, it's a lot of work. Um, but they're, um, everyone is willing to um, um, get into the details, think outside of the box and come up with solutions that are suitable to uh, everyone sitting around at the table. And I'd say probably lastly, um, the one of our biggest limitations that, that we have found um, is um, in making um, herd decisions, status decisions annually, it's very difficult to bring um, community and traditional knowledge to the table when communities are not able to go out and harvest these herds. Um, m most of the herds that we're dealing with that I spoke to um, either have, uh, uh, they're completely closed uh, or there are severe restrict harvest restrictions on these herds. So it's very difficult um, to pass along traditions. It's very difficult to pass along the culture uh, and therefore very difficult to bring um, um, uh, annual information to the table to uh, to look at and so um, this makes it very important to have um, our elders and harvesters at the table uh, so they can give us past experiences that we're able to attribute to um, making these herd status decisions. I'll leave it there. I thought I was figuring out the mic. No? No? Yes? Yeah. That better? Okay. Fine. Great. <clears throat> yeah, I guess we're not figuring out the mics. Um, thank you for those terrific presentations and, and summaries of things. Many things, um, many themes have come up over and over, um, and I'd love to dig into all of them, but. I don't think we have time. So one question that comes to mind, Jody, you'd mentioned the word relationships. And I'm curious because there are lots of technical details that we can work on, but it seems to me ultimately these are all about how people work together. And I'm wondering if you'd like to comment, Joe and Gina, you had talked last night, for example, about the way you've created that, the, I'll call it the culture of the caribou hat, that people are there for the purpose of benefiting the caribou. Um, you know, and that's a little different than other cases where people come in with their their agenda and so on. So I'm curious, how, how have you created that, that relationship and that institutional culture where where people really focus on, on that shared goal? I, 
I think one of the reasons is trust. Uh, we take the time to go to the communities. Uh, we do have uh, technical committees that we rely on to get good information um, to make management decisions. And I think one of the things that we're proud of seeing is that when we do go to the communities and we have our meetings straddled between the NWT and the Yukon in each user communities, we bring along our biologists from either the NWT or the Yukon. And I think that does a lot because it, it puts a face to the person that's actually getting that information for us. And I know, I know, you know, in a couple of days, they're gonna have a big caribou days in Oak Row, and right away they're talking about they want the caribou biologists there because they wanna get information, they wanna get information in regards to where the caribou are, or if their condition is good, or if it's not good. And this is just one way of, of bringing our resource people to the community, and it does two things. One, it shows who the person is, and it's uh, the other reason is it, it 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 creates a relationship between the two, and I think that 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 really goes a long way for the communities. Merci. Just wanted to add to that. Thanks, Joe. Um, the board members um, they represent their party. They're appointed by their party, but but when they come to the table, it's like their job is to help the board, all the board, to understand maybe some of the some of the nuances of, of a position or a perspective, but also um, then depending on what the board the board decides, or and, and they're just a, an advisory body as well. But whatever whatever they come up with that that board member, <clears throat> excuse me, is also kind of a, a bridge between <clears throat> the board and their party so that they go back to the party and kind of explain the board's perspective. So, so that helps to kind of navigate some things that um, maybe aren't quite in line with what they individually would do um, and that they think is best, but that, um, that it's, it's easier to understand those various perspectives and then to kind of navigate, well, this is what, what, it, what, what it's, we're gonna land on and so this is why and this is maybe what we need to do. So those board members are in, integral in that. <clears throat> yeah, I would just also add, I think it, strong relationships are built obviously on trust, but that trust also comes from the ability to really um, be able to hash out the issues, right? There's, we don't always see eye to eye and it's not all roses and, you know, and I think hashing that out, understanding each other's perspectives, finding uh, solutions when possible, and then you walk out of the room and you're shaking hands and having coffee and I think that's um, kind of something I've witnessed a lot uh, with our board. I, I'd have to agree that um, being able to have those frank conversations and and look at what's best for the resource, regardless of your hat, regardless of land ownership, those animals don't know those boundaries. They're artificial boundaries to us as tribal people and they're artificial boundaries to the fish and the wildlife. It's, it's a governmental boundary put in land ownership or management of those resources. They're, they're, we don't know those boundaries. And it wasn't, it was statehood that changed that. It was ANCSA that changed that. It was ANILCA that changed it for us here in Alaska and created the parks and the preserves and, you know, um, I was visiting in Whitehorse here a couple weeks ago with uh, Joe Jack. Uh, his grandpa was Copper Jack, who came from Chitna in Alaska, where my family's from. So we started talking about that and how we, we have family there in Yukon. And we're, you know, that border between Alaska and Canada is another artificial line. That, that you know is imposed on on us as people but it's imposed on you know and you can't have management like intensive management in on one side and not on the other and 
expect to um, have healthy populations. You have to look at this in a more holistic approach, which is the traditional way to do things, and look at how everything else is tied together. We need that balance. In one of the sessions, they talked about, um, you know, are you, you saying target one species? No, we need to find that balance. And there is a finite balance. And for us, it's learning the vocabulary that best fits the organizations that we're dealing with in, in those partnerships, because we want the same thing. We all want the same thing. We want healthy populations, right? We want healthy populations so that we're not fighting over the last moose, we're not fighting over the last caribou, we're not fighting over that last salmon. We're working to keep healthy populations and being able to do that without our hats and to be able to do what's best for the resource is so important in put our egos aside to be able to get things done. I don't care who's the author of this. It needs to be done to protect the resources. We manage the largest caribou herd in the state. Half the state is uh, where most of the uh, Western Arctic caribou herd work, working group come from. From Barrow, as far as uh, Eagle all the way down to the Nome area. <clears throat> I got about 23, 24, 24 guys representing different areas in the state, in the northern part, because of our herd is the largest. And right now they're in a critical, critical stages, low count. And I would like to thank the management uh, for working out so much for, uh, in the past, Management, the uh, government agents, Mr. Dow, I'd like to thank him a lot. I, I, I can't thank him enough to help out our people. I'm not here just for, for me and for the people. I didn't come here, I, I, I came to a, my first meeting and automatically almost was the chairman. Someone must have did their research. <laughs> so, it, it didn't take me long to become big, a chairman, you know. I make a lot of noise. I do make a lot of noise. The state, our bro, Nana. When the, when the hunting season starts August 1, moose season opens, our corporation get about nine, ten guys on the rivers start patrolling the Nana lands. On land and air, both. To watch from the outside hunters. And we get a lot of hunters. Sports hunters. We get a lot of sports hunters. All they want is that nice, fancy horn. Where's the meat? Left in the plastic bag someplace. Pretty hard to see uh, when you bring out guide and, uh, and they leave the meat outside the runway in a plastic bag. That's not, that's not right. Someone brought it up that we should teach the guides how to preserve caribou, how to take care of it. What's edible, what's not edible. This brings me a story, right? I brought my grandma a caribou, right? I just got it, I got it out and bring it to my grandma. And she asked me, where's the caribou? And she, it's right there. She said, no. Go back and get whatever you got out of that stomach. I want the stomach and the, the meat. So I had to go, 30 below, I had to go back 20 miles, get that gut, put it in, put it in the sled, and later bring it to my grandma. 
So I sit there watch what, what he's going to pick out. It never left my mind. Now, today, I know what's edible in the caribou. All what's left after she was done was just the gut. And I was, whoa. <laughs> you know? But just how we learn from our elders, how we grew up versus me and you. The caribou, maybe with the climate change, maybe we'll send them to Mexico, <laughs> if the worst tilts. And it did tilt, right? You noticed, anybody noticed? Because I noticed every morning I wake up for the past 50 years, how the sun came up. West, no, north. I, I, I didn't think I would realize it, but it, it is. Our rivers are emptying out. They're getting shallower. All the water is going down below. So if the earth went upside down and we're south pole instead of north pole, not going to happen in my lifetime, but it probably will happen. But the co-management, the, uh, the guys that work in the Western Arctic Caribou Herd Working Group, could you please stand up that work with the uh, management and all the guys that Jim Dow starts with Jeff that just stand up and working with, with us over the years that's been putting up a lot of work together with the Western Arctic Caribou Herd Working Group guys standing up. Thank you very much for all your hard work. And thank, I would like to thank the people from Canada or from wherever they are. Thank you, and you guys have a safe trip back home. Thank you. Um, it's always so hard to kind of go at the end and after some elders, and I'm very humbled to be allowed to be sitting on the panel today. Um, uh, I think uh, one of the things uh, back to relationships and, re um, and uh, what every elder I've ever heard say is work together. Um, and it, it takes work, it's not easy. Some days um, working together uh, makes uh, it perfect sense and things easily come together and we join hands and sing kumbaya at the end of the meeting. But other times it's much more difficult. Uh, we have to really get into the details um, and remembering that everybody has this passion about caribou and wanting to make sure that their traditions and their cultures continue. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that uh, we try to do when we're in these meetings and we're down into the details is to step back a little bit and remember that despite the regional differences, despite the jurisdictional differences, despite Indigenous and non-Indigenous, we really, at the end of the day, have those same uh, core values that the elders have taught us. Respect the caribou, respect the land, take only what you need, um, use everything, all the parts. Do not waste. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, take only what you need. I think I said that, but I'll say it again because it's a really good one. Um, but it's those, it's those um, simple but exquisitely important details um, that bring us all together and make that relationship building easy. If you can separate out the politics and your... Um, uh, uh, and who you're representing. Be there for the wildlife. Be there um, to make sure that um, this amazing land, this amazing resource, the amazing caribou that you all get to work with, whatever kind it may be, um, that you're going to pass that on to your grandchildren's grandchildren. Because that's what we're here doing. That's what we're here for. That's what the passion is about, is um, we don't want to see these declines stay where they're at. We want to see them recover. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't want to walk away and, and leave that. And that's why 
we come to these conferences and we keep going to the meetings and keep trying to um, come up with solutions that work for all. And I think uh, when, like I said, when you strip away all of that stuff and you look at it, um, really everybody is coming at it from the same perspective. We just don't always see it that way. Um, and so, uh, yeah, respect the land, respect the wildlife, take only what you need, um, and work together. Um, the elders taught us best, let's listen. Thank you, Jody. We have a couple of minutes left and I just wanna ask if uh, Joe or Karen would like to offer any concluding remarks. <clears throat> Jody brought up a good point in, in, in that respect for the land and stuff. We were taught to, if we take care of it, it will take care of us. And, but we also have a lot of folks that come to visit. The blessing and curse of living on the highway system is accessibility. And um, so we end up with an influx of anywhere from six to 10,000 people, usually around 8,000 people to come and hunt caribou and, and moose. In, in our territory, we get uh, six to 10,000 people that come to fish in our territory. That's the blessing and the curse, but it can't just be on the indigenous people to take care of the land. It needs to be on everybody, thank you. It does, it needs to be everyone. And that respect for the land, that respect for the resources, when they leave things behind, it's being disrespectful and we were taught if we don't take care of it in the right way, they won't come back. And that's some of what we're seeing in, in these declines too is they're not taking care of it in the right way and taking care of the land or taking care of the animal after they harvest in the right way. So they're not coming back. And we need to, you know, I don't know how we can educate them anymore. Um, but they talk about hunter ethics classes and those kinds of things, but it's much more than that. And, and it's not everybody. It's never everybody. There's a few that leave a bad name for others. And, and then we end up with these kinds of things. And I just got to say that <clears throat> in, in, from all of this, that. Our successes are built on these partnerships. Our successes are built on um, working toward what's best for the resource, what's best for the land, what's best for the resource. And that's what our successes are built on. Looking for common ground and standing on that common ground and building off of that. You need a solid foundation, and that's those relationships that we build. We, always, we have good relationships with our local offices sometimes, but it's the DC office that causes problems or sets priorities or uh, restrictions that doesn't work. They've never walked this land. Our elders tell us we have to walk this land to know it, and you can't run wildlife from somewhere else, you have to be out there on the land. And so just look for that common ground. Look for what we can do together to do what's best for the land and the resources. Thank you. I think uh, one of the things that really concerns the communities is, is global warming. Uh, climate change, one of the things that we've always con constantly hear from the communities is why are the caribou not coming back? Why are they gone for most of the time? And over the past 10 years, most of the caribou, the porcupine caribou have been going more west um, when they leave the calving grounds towards the Denali, and that's really concerning. Um, you know, for, for, for good management, um, we definitely need to do a lot more for the caribou. And um, it's not always a rosy picture. I mean, we have over-harvesting. 
we have uh, wastage, we have wounding loss, um, but with, 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 with good communication with the communities, hopefully over the, over the years we can, we can alleviate all those little problems so that um, at the end of the day, we're gonna have caribou there for future generations. We'll see. I just wanted to add, those were lovely comments from both of you. Um, looking out, like I, I, see, I see a number of faces that I've seen for years. And, um, and, and it, it feels like sometimes um, you know, there's new people that come in and new research that's done and new work, new people in co-management, but, um, but it's important. And we were talking yesterday, with these lovely ladies, and, and, um, and there are people who, who have been here for years. And, um, and, and very rarely have I met any, anyone working in this field that is, that is just doing a job, that's just working to do a job. There, there, I think it speaks to personal commitment and to, to passion, yes, but that's what kind of drives things sometimes more so even than your, your, your work, your nine to five work, and, and it matters. And so it's, I feel like it matters to acknowledge that and to, and to reach out to those working, you know, in, in these various positions and, um, and, and acknowledging them and expressing appreciation for that because, because, um, because their work is valuable and, um, and many are here long after they've retired and many are doing things um, you know, on, this, on the side of their desk and pushing things way beyond what they need to be doing in their job description. And so um, I feel like sometimes that's overlooked and I personally, I feel I value that when I see others and, and the work that they do and their commitment and over the years to see all these faces still here. And, um, and it makes me more motivated to, um, you know, to, to, to keep working on what we're doing as well. Just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We're, we're uh, unfortunately out of time. The, when we were planning or preparing for this, the panelists asked me to pass on. They would love to keep talking about this, so feel free to ask them questions and, and continue the conversation. Uh, just to wrap up, I, there are, again, many things going through my mind, but the one that sticks, who we've heard several times, is that of respect. And I would like to thank all of the panelists for, for living that value and showing the respect for the land, for the animals, and for one another for the forms of knowledge that we have, as, as Dina just expressed, everyone who's working on this together. And I think that foundation of respect is, is essential. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to thank, if you would please join me in thanking Jody, Tina, Dina, Joe, Karen, and Vern again for, for a terrific panel. <laughs> <laughs>